Speaking of which, a party you talk about quite a bit. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, let's look, this is a personal challenge to you. Let me bring up the Libertarian Party. Yeah. And the personal challenge is to go five minutes without mocking them. Okay. In discussing, uh, in discussing this idea. So first of all, what... <laughs> <laughs> I'm being trolled. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'm being this, trolled. Uh, I, okay, I'm being trolled. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I'm being trolled. Okay. Yeah, this this, is good. Do you remember the fun friends? There was yeah. an episode where Chandler had to not make fun of people. Like, can you go one day, Chandler? <laughs> and Phoebe starts telling him about like this UFO she saw. And yeah. he's like, that's very interesting <laughs> and nice for you. <laughs> this is exactly that. Okay. So a true master would be able to play within the game within the constraints. Yeah. So, um, no, I, I'm pretty sure you'll still mock them. But No, no, I, I'll stick to the, the rules. Five so, minutes, easy. <laughs> so first of all, speaking broadly about libertarianism, can you speak to that, how you feel about it? And then also to the Libertarian Party, which is the implementation of it in our current system. So I think libertarianism is a great idea. And I think there's many libertarian ideas that have become much more mainstream, which I'm very, very happy about. I remember there was an article in either New York or New Yorker magazine in the early 90s, where they talked about the Cato Institute, which is a libertarian think tank. And they referred to the fact that Cato was against war and against like regulation with a wacky consistency. Uh, cause they didn't know how to reconcile these two things. I don't remember what the two things were, but I remember that expression, wacky consistency. And it wasn't even, we were all taught, and this is very much before the internet, that there's two tribes. And if you're pro-life, you have to hate gays. And if you're for socialized medicine, that also means you have to be for, uh, um, uh, you know, free speech. It, it was just this very, and like, there's a whole menu and you got to sign into all of them. And that menu is terrible. They hate America. They want to destroy it. Right. Oh my God, those are horrible evil. You, this is the menu you want. And the Libertarian Party, to some extent, and just Libertarians as a whole said, you know, you can do the Chinese buffet and take a little from column A, a little from column B and have an ideology that is coherent and consistent an ideology, ideology of peace and uh, non-aggression and, and things like that. The Libertarian Party takes its model from like the early progressive and populist parties from the early 20th century, which were not very effective in terms of getting people elected, but were extremely effect effective in terms of getting the two major parties to appropriate and adopt their ideas and implement them. And in Britain as well, the Liberal Party got destroyed and be became taken over by Labour as the uh, alternative party to the Tories um, and have those ideas basically become mainstreamed. So I think that, and the Liberty, my friend who passed away, Eric, I miss him dearly, uh, was the webmaster. And his whole point is, if you don't think of it in terms of a party, in terms of getting people elected, but if you think of it as a party in terms of getting people educated about alternatives, then there's an enormous use for that. That was his perspective. And I don't think that's an absurd uh, perspective, but here's some libertarian ideas that have become extremely mainstream. War should be a last resort. Uh, this is something we're taught as kids and we all say, but for many years, it's been like, it, they don't think of it as a last resort. It's like something's bad. Well, it's like the first instinct. Now it's like, let's really give it a week, just a week. Like what's going on in Syria? Is there really gonna be a genocide, the Kurds? You know, things like that. So that's one. Another thing is drug legalization. Uh, this was, you know, when you and I were kids, oh, it's crazy. It's only hippies want to smoke pot. Now it's like, with it, I was on a grand jury and I, the point I, uh, people make is, are you sure that this 16 year old who's selling weed, let's say selling, should his life be ruined? Should he yeah. be imprisoned with rapists and murderers? Like if you say yes, say yes, but you but are you sure, you have yeah. to acknowledge that that's what you're meaning. And then a lot of people are like, wait a minute, there, there's gotta be a third option than he has no consequences or he's imprisoned with a rapist. Like I'm not comfortable with either of these. Uh, and I think the other one is a, an increasing skepticism. This libertarians were on top of this first and the hard left of the police. Uh, as of now, asset forfeiture steals more from people than burglaries. What people don't know about what asset forfeiture is, if the cops come to your house and they suspect you, you haven't been convicted of using your car or your house or whatever in terms of selling drugs, they can take whatever they want and then you have to sue to prove your innocence and get your property back. It's a complete violation of due process. People don't realize it's going on. It's a great way for the cops to increase their budgets and it's legal. And libertarians were the, like the 
first big one saying, guys, this is not American and this is crazy. And now increasingly people on conservatives and leftists are like, wait a minute, this, this is, even if you are selling drugs, like they take your house, what are you talking about? So I think those are some uh, mechanisms that libertarianism, though, though but not by name, has become far more popular. Yeah, that's interesting. So the idea, yeah, co a coherent set of ideas uh, that that eventually get integrated into a two-party system. Yeah. The war, that's an interesting one. You're right. I would wonder, I wonder what the thread there is. I, I wonder how it connects to 9-11 and so on, but. I, I, think the, I, I think the Patriot Act. Patriot Act, For okay. people who are politically savvy, we're like, oh, okay, this is not a joke. This is really a crazy infringement of our freedoms. And both parties are falling over each other to sign into law and the Orwellian name, you don't want to, how can you be against patriotism? What kind right. of person, you know what I mean? So that I think for a lot of people, especially both civil libertarians on the left and a lot of conservatives who are constitutionalists are like, wait a minute, this isn't, I'm not comfortable with this. And I'm also not comfortable with how comfortable everyone in Washington is with it. You're right, probably libertarian, libertarians and libertarianism is a place of ideas, which is why I have a connection to it. Like, I, I like, I, I like the, every time I listen to those folks, I like them. I feel connected to them. I would even sometimes, depending on the day, call myself a libertarian. Well, we're all on the spectrum, so that's why. We're all on the spectrum, yeah. But like when I look at the people that actually rise to the top, in terms of like the people who represent the party, this is where like five minutes ran out, right? You can, yeah, I could go, you can, I'm you allowed. Can, you can go, why are they so weird? Why aren't strong candidates emerging that represent as political, like representatives, or as like uh, famous speakers, yeah. like that represent I mean, the ideology? I think uh, libertarians tend to, be, I think Jonathan Haidt, in his book and uh, his research, he's a political scientist and he does a lot of things about how people come to their political conclusions and what f factors uh, um, force people to reach conclusions. And he found that libertarians are the least empathetic and most rationalistic uh, of all the groups. And by that, he means like they think in terms of logic as opposed to like people's feelings and, and that has positives and has negatives. Uh, it would, and we have the AB testing with Ron Paul. Ron Paul ran for president as a libertarian nominee. He was the nominee. He got pretty much nowhere in 1988. Then he ran as a return to the Republican Party. He was a congressman for many years from Texas. He ran for the presidency in 2008 and 2012. And in 2008, he stood on stage with Rudy Giuliani and told him that the, they were here in 9-11 because we're over there, which would, would have been a shocking, horrifying taboo a few years earlier. Many people were like, holy crap, this is amazing. Giuliani was all offended and Ron Paul's like- That took some guts, by the way. When I, I yeah, it did. That, when I heard that, it was so refreshing. That not what he said, but the fact that he said something that took guts. It made me realize how rare it is yes. for people, for politicians, but even people to say something that takes guts. Well, it's also the idea that like you can't, even if you think America has a right to invade any country on earth as much as it wants and kill people as a consequence of war and blow up their buildings and, and destroy their country. You can't with a straight face not expect us to have consequences, even if they're consequences from evil people. Even mm -hmm. if we're 100% the good guys and they're 100% the bad guys, those bad guys, some of them are still gonna try to do something. What happens next, you know what I mean? So that kind of concept that there's any American culpability was we're America, we're the, you know, we are the good guys by definition, we're not culpable to have people start thinking about what if there's another way? You know, what if we're not there and then they're not here and we're kind of doing a backdoor, we're talking, so uh, different scenarios. So, so the fact that he got so much more traction as a Republican, the fact that Donald Trump, who came out of nowhere, became the not only the candidate, but the president tells people, it's like getting a book deal, right? You can either go, th there's three choices, you can either self-publish, mainstream publisher, or independent publisher. The th independent publisher is the worst of all choices because you're not getting a big advance. They're not gonna be able to promote you a lot and they don't get the distribution. Mainstream, I've done mainstream and self, right? With self, I don't have the, the cred the re respectability of a mainstream or the cachet. You can't be a uh, New York Times bestseller. Right, it, it takes, takes a lot of work, but I get a lot more of the profit 
Uh, if it looks good on the shelf on Amazon, looks identical, so on and so forth. With the mainstream, the benefits and costs are pretty much obvious to most people. So the same thing. It's like you can either be an independent like Ross Perot, or you could be just seize one of the party apparatus, which the benefits are enormous there. But in terms of going third party, I don't know the libertarian party apparatus other than maybe some ballot access is really that efficacious. In, and then you're going to have a lot of baggage. Because if you hear independent, Jesse Ventura, Ross Perot, you think of the person. Now you have to define yourself and you have to defend the party. That's two bridges for most people.